a lot of ancestries that you're going to chase. This area here grew up mostly in about the 1860s, 1840, 1860s. Gravity railroads come in the coal country. Uh, I can talk a little bit if you want to on the gravity railroad or I can talk a little bit on how to do your family genealogy. I am a little bit more on both. Uh, if not a lot of you are interested in the Revolutionary War, we can hit a little bit more on the genealogy part of it. I'm one of the first ones that uh, started here at the organization and I'm really involved in storing your family's history. Uh, we look at the obituaries every single day. We record a lot of the local obituaries, uh, ones that's in our family. Uh, if you want to get technical, everybody here is related. Everybody. You go back 10 generations, you have 1,000 grandparents. You go back 20 generations, you got 1.2 million grandparents. So 21 generations, you got 2.4 million grandparents. So it's impossible, it's mathematically impossible that everybody's not related. It's just making those connections. Uh, you get back into the Revolutionary War times, even the Civil War times in this area here. You go into the local graveyards, you go into a local graveyard, everyone in that graveyard is related in one way or the other. Descendants from them, married, you get to Peckville, even look at the paper today. Where were they born? They were born in Scranton. Where did they die? They died in Scranton. Where's their kids living? Their kids lived in Scranton. When you're growing, growing up in an area, you don't, most of the time, you don't have the opportunity of marrying somebody that's way out of the area. You're marrying a neighbor or a girlfriend's girlfriend. So you get into these hubs, especially when you get back into the 1800s. Everybody in them areas are related. I've gone back to uh, Revolutionary War times. My 15th great-grandfather was John Alden. He come over on the Mayflower. He married Priscilla Mullen. Priscilla was the first white woman to be born in New England. She married a Southworth. But I've gone to every one of my ancestors' graveyards from there all the way down to today. If you're going to be doing ancestry, uh, you're going to want a computer. If you start doing it with papers, it's going to be so overwhelming, you're never going to be able to sort them out. You definitely want a computer, and you want to put the information in a computer so it's easy to research and easy to find. If you go, I have one file, and it's called my family document file and everything's in my family document file but when you open it up there's a file in there and it'll have on it Homer L. Butler and it'll have my date of birth the date of death is empty so as soon as you create a file with that name they're automatically in alphabetical order so now you can scan your birth certificate, your census records, you can scan everything and put it in that file. Now if you only have one person, say you go out and you find all these tombstones, put their last name, comma, first name, date of birth, date of death. You go into that file, here's everybody's information in that file. Your grandparents, you're going to want to get a separate file for your grandparents because there's going to be hundreds of documents you can put in for your grandparents photos. If you go to print out photos, it's okay to put them into the, to the file, but if you really get into genealogy, you're going to have so much information, you don't want to put out a lot of photos. You want to get a good photo of the person that you're researching, have that photo. If they're in the military, try to get a good military photo, put that in and put everything in order. As you put this stuff in order, if you go in a person's file and a person's name is in there, that file will show up under that name. As soon as you get in the file, you can put down dates. Now when you put down a date, you can put down his birth date. My birth date is March 
15, 1950. So I would put down 1950, 03, 016. So when you open up their file, everything is recorded in there by date. So you have a file for their name so you can look at it real fast. Now everything's recorded in there by date. Fifteen years ago I passed and I become an EMT. My EMT card's in there and the date I become an EMT, that's in there. I graduated college. Copy of my diploma, the date I graduated, that's in there. My advanced first date, that's in there. I'm a federal mine inspector, that's in there. I was awarded for uh, work I started the cogen plant here in Archibald. I was on the co uh, control board the day that started. They gave me a special plaque for that. That's in there. But you can put dates and store all your information under your name, and all that information doesn't need to come out. What was that? Your Revor? Revor, the, well, first of all, if I'm a, I do reenactments. We don't do them anymore. Anymore, we go around the like Fort Ticonderoga. We go into Storebridge Village the second month in August. We go down to uh, Colonial Williamsburg. We go in and we sit on a bench like this and we show the kids how our muskets work. This is a musket they would have used in the Rev War. This was a 69 caliber Charlieville. We were backed up by the French during the Revolutionary War. The beginning of the Revolutionary War, they had everything. Brown best, rifles, any type of musket you can think they've used. When the French started helping us, they gave us Charlieville muskets. And this would have been a Charlieville. This is 69 caliber meaning it's five-eighths of a diameter, the bullet. Your brown best, they were 75. So this was a little bit smaller than what the brown best was. They can pull. That would be the size of a musket ball for the brown best. This would be the size for the Charlieville. One's three-quarters of an inch and the other's five-eighths of an inch. These musket balls a lot of people don't realize a lot of your gunpowder was transported in lead kegs. Lead was waterproof. If I want to hide some gunpowder, I can take the gunpowder and I can put it in the bottom of the creek and I know where it's at. Pull the lead out, open it up, dump the gunpowder out, and then I have the lead keg. I can melt the lead keg down and make my musket balls. I have a die here. When they made their musket balls, I know I have one in here someplace. Anyway, it's a form that they would take the lead and dump the lead into the musket ball. They'd open it up, they clip. That they didn't have. Let me shut this thing off. <laughs> I'll pass these around. You can look at it a little bit. See what you think they are or what they're made out of. We'll touch on that a little later. But anyway, on these muskets, to fire the muskets, they use cartridges. Your quartermaster would be over the cartridges. At the end of the day, they would turn the cartridge box in. The quartermaster would count how many cartridges you had, how many you used, and he would refill it. Go on out and give you the cartridge box. You put the cartridge box in. Now on the bottom of this 
box, I have a bunch of flints. I have a flint and I have a flint tool in here to clean, change the flints out. How they made these cartridges, they would take a paper, cut it on an angle, they would roll it up. First time they rolled it, they would take the musket ball and put the musket ball against the bottom and roll the paper over on it. Then they would finish rolling it up. These ones I have, these have been dipped in beeswax and bear fat. It was used as a lubricant for the musket ball. Just like today, you have a patch. Then they would fill these cartridges with black powder. These are all full. These, that's gunpowder. That's black powder. After they filled the cartridge with gunpowder, they would fold it over, and that would be your cartridge. To be a Revolutionary War soldier, there was a requirement. You had to have opposing teeth, meaning you had to be able to bite. When they pull this cartridge out, the cartridge is on the side, when they pulled it out and flipped that tab up, they had to bite that crease and tear the, that tab off of the cartridge. That would expose the black powder. Then they would dump the black powder down the barrel. Yep. We're in Rev War. <laughs> Rev War has a pan. So they would prime the pan, close it, Swing it about, dump the powder down the barrel, put the musket ball in. You would put the powder in the pan because these are flint locks. So when this comes back and hits this, when the hammer hits the cock, what it's going to do is spray marks down into the pan. So you'd have to have powder in that pan that would flash. In that flash in the pan, there's a hole in the side of this barrel. These are your musket tools. There's a hole in the side of the barrel right where that, this is the cleaner to clean it. As that flashed, it would go into the barrel and set off the powder. One thing that you could do if, if they had that hole a little bit bigger, if you took the powder, you could dump the powder down the barrel and put the musket ball in, hit it on the ground, and as that musket ball went down the barrel, a lot of times when it got hot, it would melt that wax in the, the beet bear's fat. It would go down the barrel and just the air buildup would blow powder out into the, flat, into the pan so it actually primed itself. But once that musket ball was in, you pulled out your rod and you would ram the musket and that would ram the musket ball all the way down to the bottom. If you look here, this ramrod's just sticking out of the top. That means this musket's empty. When we do reenactments before we do them, we have to test every one of the muskets to make sure they're empty. And when you ham, you can hear this bouncing. That means there's nothing in this. This is hasn't been fired since it's been clean. They would take the ramrod out after that musket ball was seated, pull back on the hammer, present, aim, and they fire. Now that sparks, that spark would hit cock here and that would throw the spark down into the pan and that's what would set off that black powder. The Charlevilles actually fired a little bit better than what the Brown Best did. One of the things that the Charleville had was on this cock, if you notice, it has a slight curve to it. When that flint hits it, it slides down the whole distance of it so it takes more spark off. If you looked at the brown best musket, this here's straight. So when you close it, when it hits, it's hitting in one spot all the time. So when it hits in one spot, it really is not scraping. So the Charleville puts out a lot more spark. It, I felt there, it's a better weapon. Another thing, the 5 8 musket ball, you're using basically about the same amount of powder. You got a musket ball that's a little bit lighter, so the musket ball will go a lot further.
in what about a we have another reenactor here <laughs> in about what a hundred feet you get a hubcap all the time at 50 yards from my best I can get my However, that's a modern gun, it's a modern powder, a modern ball. But back then, I would say at about 100, you get a, about the size of a hubcap, right? The story is that the British officer once said that the average soldier who gets hit with an average soldier's must get 120 yards is considered a month. We were up to uh, one of our the president of the organization lives up in Knoxon and we were up there shooting and it was I'm gonna say what about 500 feet back to the creek about 500 feet back about 500 feet back to the creek well we were shooting at a 55 gallon drum and there was times we were missing the drum now you're talking 500 feet away when we fired you could see the limbs coming off the tree 500 feet away you could see where in, so it'd be luck if you hit, if somebody was standing still, I'd rather be standing still and them aiming at me than I would be, uh, you know, just where that musket ball hit. But at 500 feet, there's still enough power in this musket ball to kill someone. That's why the British, if you look at the British commands, the British never aimed and fired. It was present fire. You look at a lot of the British, they presented, and some of them even have their heads turned because it was just the vast amount of British in a line. They would present and they would fire. So in a battle, you didn't use that many cartridges. A lot of times in a skirmish with the Continentals, they only fired seven, seven, ten shots is all they fired. You're, this holds, what, 22, 20? They didn't, they didn't fire very many shots in a battle. If they come up against the British, they fired a couple shots and they got out of there. They didn't stay to get mowed down. Uh, they get close enough to... They would get... They would... They, when they lined up, they were getting pretty close. They're 50, 50 yards probably. 50 yards before they start firing at one another, but then they would start looking for cover, too. Uh, all your tools for this musket, these are tools to maintain the musket. As you fire this musket off, you're going to get a buildup of black powder in here. You have a brush, and this brush could actually clean that black powder out. You'd have a rag where you, and I wiped it off is your flint strikes the cock all the time it'll build up a white powder on here and the more the white powder builds up the less sparks you're going to get so they would have a rag and they would wipe that off to keep it clean so it fired more often uh, in the Revolutionary War, they did have riflemen. When they had riflemen, this is a tool that they would have used. This is a powder horn, but a small powder horn. This would be used out of a flask to, to uh, load their rifle. And this one here is, this is 50 grain. So what they would do, they would fill this up level, and instead of a cartridge, they would dump the powder down the rifle. It took longer to load the rifle, but they would use an exact amount of powder every time. They used the same size rag all the time, which was their patch. They would put the ball in. Every rifle that was made, there was a mold made for that rifle, because a lot of the rifles were like 45 caliber. See them 45 caliber, a lot of them didn't come out exact, so that mold might have been a 42 caliber, a 45 caliber, a 46, a 47. When the gunsmith was done making that rifle, he would make a mold to, to have that bullet fit that rifle barrel. So when he went down in, he was firing the same consistency all the time. And 
the rifle, that's what the British didn't like. The riflemen would get up and they would pick off the commanders and stuff, and that was deemed, you're not supposed to pick off officers. And the Continental Army, we love picking off officers. So uh, the clothes I have on, if I was in the military back during the Revolutionary War, just by looking at me, you'd know that I wouldn't be a Continental soldier. For the first thing, George Washington's men could have more than a three-day growth of beard. You could not have more than three days growth. You had to be clean-shaven. Uh, being the 24th Connecticut Militia Regiment, a lot of our men that were in the 24th Connecticut, Connecticut was one of the states that supplied their men with uniforms. They were well supplied. Uh, they had uniforms, but they were basically more supplied than what a lot of the other regiments were. Uh, I would be more of a militia, one that stayed back at the fort, guard the fort, sit there, somebody goes to attack the fort, I would fight from the fort. Uh, the hats, everything had a purpose. Your hat, the reason this hat is folded up on the side is because during the Rev War, that's the side you held your gun on. If you look at your trite hats, you'll see some of them are cocked where the, the tri starts here and the point comes over on this side. That's more of a, militia, uh, a military hat because the gun barrel can clear it. If they see ones that's straight, that's more of a civilian hat. Uh, but they didn't waste nothing either. This, anyone know what this would be? Let me tell you, they come in different sizes. Any ideas? It's a safety pin. Safety pin. They come in different sizes. You take this pin, you curl it like this, you pull it out, you put the pin in, pin comes back into the bottom, you curl it around, and there's your safety pin. You can get big ones, small ones, but that was a safety pin back then. Uh, the bowl in the spoon that's going around. Anybody know what that's made out of? Tortoise. Huh? Tortoise. Tortoise. Horn. Horn? Horn. This is a cow's horn. That's okay. How do they know that? You see the bottom of that spoon? Where do you have something that's like that? Look at your thumb. See the white spot coming out in your thumb? That's the white spot coming out at the base of the horn. Your corn, horns were hollow. They would split the horn. You take a horn and if you boil it, the horn becomes soft. So now you take two pieces of wood and you carve the shape of the spoon out and as soon as the horn becomes soft you put down on the two pieces of wood and you clamp the wood together and that pinches on this horn and then when that horn dries out it becomes hard again and here's your spoon. And then you do it and here's your bowl. And then they flattened them out and then they cut them in the V's and there's your hair combs. They wasted nothing, believe me. Anything that they, they didn't waste a thing. Uh, I thought those were made out of tortoise shell. Another thing they had, everybody knows what these are, right? These are wampum beads. This is money. Back then, what good was a Pennsylvania dollar bill that was printed on paper when Pennsylvania's fighting with Connecticut or even Connecticut money? You got Connecticut money and now your soldiers are heading down to Philadelphia to fight with Washington and Philadelphia. What good your Connecticut? Half the people, this is wampum beads. The longer the belt, the more it was worth. 
Today, I think they're what, about 65 cents a bead for wampum beads? I don't know, I've never, I've never. Yeah, heard. you can buy. I bought a small strip at once and never bothered with that. The, the plastic ones are about 13 cents, anywhere from six to 13 cents for the plastic ones. But these are seashells. And they polish the seashells, drill holes in them, and then they put them in different colors that mean different things. This is what they bought Long Island with. So you would have, if you were traveling, you would have stuff like this wampum that you could trade. You would have real good deer hides that you skun, so everybody could use deer skins. You, you might take the deer skins and shave it off and make it real soft so you had soft leather made from deer skins. Uh, canteens, they would make canteens out of leather. And what was a deer skin worth? <laughs> I don't know a dollar amount. A buck. A buck. <laughs> a buck. <laughs> I was going to say what you could trade it for. But everything in this area was bartered. You, don't, you didn't have basically any money. It was all bartered. Uh, you would trade something for something else. And here you're a soldier, you're away. Buttons. A lot of the buttons, they would make the buttons out of lead. You make them out of lead, you need bullets. Where do you get your lead from? Buttons, a lot of buttons. What's some other things they made buttons out of? Anyone know? Acorns? Nuts? Acorns? Nuts? Yeah. Oh. Not. Wooden? Sickle. Wooden buttons? Nope. Nope. Another thing that was real popular was deer horns. The deer horn is real hard. So they would take the deer horns and they'd slice the deer horns up. And the deer horn, here's the deer horn right here. You feel that? I mean, this isn't going to break. They slice that into small sections, put holes in it. There's another button. If you were really wealthy, gold. You look at the military men where they have their gold buttons. Some of them buttons back then were gold. Here you had gold. You wanted to get rid of it. Here, I'll pay you for it with this. They, but uh, it, life was, was totally different. Uh, your men, when they come in, you can imagine 5,000 men coming into this area. There's no stores, there's nothing. You got 5,000 people you're going to have to feed. When they come into an area, believe me, they were moving. Their commanders knew they couldn't stay a long time in a certain area. They come in this area and when they went through this area, any deer that was close was gone. Any rabbits were gone. Any squirrels were gone. I mean, they had a foliage of what was available to them. When they went through, if they stayed in an area for a week or so, the animal population is gone because they had to keep enough food to keep the men going. The women, a lot of times, they traveled behind. Uh, a militia, if you had a militia unit, usually they didn't have water, uh, wagons. They traveled with carts, two-wheel carts. Uh, most of the wagons back at that time was used by the military. So if you weren't in the military, most of the travel was, was done by cart. Uh, a lot of my ancestors that come down from Massachusetts after the Revolutionary War, that's how they come down. Oxen, mule, and carts. They loaded everything in a cart and come down. Uh, you got to look at your roadways too, where they traveled. Uh, the roads that you see today, that's not where the original highways were. Sullivan's Trail actually went through the township where I'm at over in Mount Cobb. But Sullivan's Trail, right up Mount Cobb, if you got off of Interstate 84 and you come down to the light there at 348, basically a little bit before that light is where Sullivan's Trail crossed. If you got to that light, you made a right-hand uh, turn, there's a graveyard there on the right-hand side. The back of that graveyard was the front of the graveyard. You look at the back of the graveyards, you'll see some big pine trees and you'll see all the 
gravestones in the back. That's where the trail went. The trail went over the top of Music Mountain. The trail never went down. It was Henry Trinker that went down below later on, but that trail, Sullivan's Trail, went over the top of the mountain. In Hamlin, it's called Cemetery Road now. That's There's an old cemetery road there, and that's where the uh, Revolutionary War soldiers were buried. Is on, but your, your roads moved over time. What happened there with that one was they put in uh, the turnpike. When they put in the turnpike, it was a better road. Everybody started using the turnpike, so now the road changed. Uh, crossing the Delaware. You come across the Delaware back in then, if you go up to Stockport, which is outside of Equal Knock, there's a Stockport Cemetery there. If you go into Stockport Cemetery, you'll see some old tombstones there, but any time of the year, you can walk across the Delaware there. You go up and you walk across the Delaware. Now, how are you going to cross the Delaware other than walk across it? And if you get down around Port Jervis and stuff, the hills are so high on each side, there's no way to, and the water gets so deep, there was no way to maneuver across. Now, there in Port Jervis, they build a, a, a bridge later. That burnt down right at the Civil War. I think it was 18... 62 and when that bridge burnt down in 1862 they actually moved the road main street in matamores port jervis was moved when the original bridge burnt down so you get back in that time frame you got to look where the old roads were and most of the cemeteries back then were off the old roads there was a there's a smith cemetery that was on the old Connecticut Trail, and it's about a mile off of 348 by uh, Sawmill Road in Hamlin. If you come out Sawmill Road and you go up to the top of the hill, and you'll see where the Sullivan Trail crossed, and you'll see the Smith Cemetery. Uh, if you're going up there to Tunkanic, uh, oh, what's the name of the lumber company there? Uh, they do all the lumber, the Crick Crosses, on uh, what we, huh? Deer, Deer Park. Deer yeah, Deer Park. Just before Deer Park Lumber, if you're heading from here, on the right-hand side of the road, you look about 500 to 600 feet off the road. You'll see a cemetery down there with Revolutionary War soldiers in it. That was the original road. It was that far, and then the next, it come another 100 feet closer. If you go by Deer Park, you'll see where the bridge crossed, 100 feet below the original. Now then 100 feet below that, you have today's bridge. So these roads, over time, you, you look up where the old roads were, that's where the soldiers traveled, and a lot of the buildings were still built, but the roads weren't nothing like they were today, not a thing. Uh, disease, disease back there, they were, they didn't get sick as often, but there was, they build up a lot of uh, immunities. You have 5,000 men, 5,000 men come into this area, and they're down here alongside of the Lackawanna River. Now they're lined up for a quarter of a mile alongside the Lackawanna River, and nobody's taken a bath in the last, let's say, the last month, month and a half. And everybody goes down into the Lackawanna River because they're all thirsty, so now we're going to drink water. So now... It's pretty good if you're next to the captain because you're probably at the head of it where you go into the river. But the poor guys at the back of that 5,000 men line, they're coming down into the river and they're getting their water and filling their canteens and everything else. And then all the other guys are still in that same river upstream from them. And the toilet facilities weren't anything like they were today. They didn't have any toilet paper. Uh, even in my time, I knew a guy that wore his overhauls until they rotted, and then he'd put another set of overhauls over them, and as the ones underneath rotted, they would fall off. Uh, he was a neighbor, Harry Young's. But back then, they didn't have the shoes. The kids didn't have any shoes. 
The kids went out and they were in their bare feet. You come into this area here, you're in the Revolutionary War times. If you have a family here, the, everybody did something. The kids, the kids either went out and grabbed uh, firewood. They would go out and pick berries. Uh, everyone had their own duty and they had to do it for the families to survive. It was a tough life, it really was. A lot of them come into this area and they broke ground here and they built their homes here after the Revolutionary War. Uh, my one fifth grade grandfather of life, Leach Stevens, founded the town of Nicholson. Well, he come up to Nicholson and for a couple of years they worked on the land up there and made a clearing and stuff so he could go back to Orange County and get his family and bring his family into the area because they could not serve, the family couldn't survive there until it was opened up. So a lot of these places, the family went ahead, uh, the husbands went ahead and prepared for the family. They built a home, built shelters, cover, but uh, had another uh, great grandfather in the Revolutionary War. He was in Orange County coming down. He was going to uh, visit a lifely at Stevens. It was a lifely at Stevens' son, and he died in South Canaan on the way to see his dad and when he did they buried him in South Canaan and then his wife was buried in Orange County New York and then they dug her up and so the families traveled but if they died alongside the road that's where they were buried they didn't haul these people back uh, you're liable to find graves in, in a certain area and you say boy there's no way they could have been buried there there's no way they could have died there but back then most of it was by foot and well the Wyoming Valley Massacre after the Wyoming Valley Massacre they loaded up the Connecticut people and sent them to send them back to Connecticut and they were dying alongside the trail and when they died they mean that's where they were buried although if it wasn't for the Indians in Shahola the whole the all of them might have been wiped out but uh, Back then, it was it was really tough. It was a a real tough life. Any questions? This was Connecticut back then. Huh? This was considered Connecticut back then. <laughs> <laughs> Connecticut was given a land grant to to develop it, and through the Susquehanna Charter, they were given out land grants through the Sus. Way and a charter to settle here. And after the Revolutionary War, if they could prove they were settled here, they let them keep the land. When Penn divided the land, they divided it in squares, and out of them squares you're going to see odd shapes, and them odd shapes is where the Connecticut people had claim to the land, so they let them keep their land. Because when the people come from Connecticut, uh, I'm going to settle down here at the creek. So when I put my house down here by the creek, uh, so-and-so's creek come in. So I'm going to own from where the creek come in up to the big pine tree alongside the creek that's a thousand feet up. And then we're going to go up on top of the hill where I put the stone wall in. And we're going to run alongside the stone wall to the great big pine tree that's on top of the hill. And then we're going to come from that pine tree down. And we have a surveyor here. And one of the problems you get back then, they measured a lot of things by chains, and they would stretch the chain out, and this is how long it is. Well, say we have a hillside that's like this, and we stretch the chain out, and we measure up that hillside, and we have 40 chains, so I got my deed, and now today they come out, well, they don't take this and drop it down and the 40 chains comes out like this because when they drop the hillsides, they all overlap. Fancy term, slope distance versus horizontal distance. Huh? Slope distance versus horizontal distance. So a lot of the original deeds there... Now when Penn subdivided, he just took and you got squares, so... What was the average life expectancy back then? A 
lot of the young ones didn't make it very, very old, especially when disease hit in. There'd be some times where a disease would hit in and kill almost 70% of the children in a certain age frame. So th that them children would be wiped out of that age frame. You were back in, you were into the 50s, 60s. It wasn't as high as it is today. Women had a bad, women's age was really, women didn't live to be very long, old. Women, they would be cooking around the uh, fireplace. Their dresses would catch a fire and they'd burn. Uh, childbirth took a lot of women a lot of women and then the it wasn't how can I put it Lifely at Stevens his his son Holloway uh, they were in Slate Hill he married Mary Ball Mary Ball was related to George Washington and Holloway's sister married Judge Fullerton and Mary Ball died during childbirth. So when she died, Judge Fullerton's wife, Holloway's sister, was watching the kids. The neighbor next door comes over to help her watch the kids. So she has her own kids. Here's Holloway's kids. So when the neighbor comes over to help, the neighbor's basically watching Holloway's kids. Holloway comes home at night. And he's there, how was my kids? And he's talking to the neighbor who's 20 years younger than him. And him and the neighbor get married. So when him and the neighbor gets married, now that family is, you know, the judge and George Wash related to George Washington. Now all of a sudden he's marrying a woman that's 20 years younger than him. The family says, you know, this maybe you should look someplace else to live so Holloway moved from Orange County to Hawley and he was the first uh, butcher in the town of Hawley when the Pennsylvania gravity went in in 1850 but that happened more than what people would really realize I mean you get out to some of these tombstones and you're looking at the age difference and you're saying no it, it <laughs> Holloway he was the butcher in Hawley he comes up and he's living in Lakeville. He has a daughter, Carrie. My great-grandfather who fought in the Civil War. His wife, Adeline Spencer, who the brother was the Spencers from Pleasant Mount, the first steam tractor. She died in childbirth. Catherine Stevens is living down the road, comes up and starts washing Horace's children. Horace ends up marrying Catherine 20, 21 years younger than him and has a total other family by him. Uh, the women in childbirth, I mean, they, they, and then you get down here into the valley, this is later on, but down in the valley, the coal mines is what killed these out. You look at the census, you might have a woman with four different husbands between the coal census and children by each one of them and three of the husbands died between census I mean they want to they want to talk about rough this valley was this valley was one of this was worse than slavery in this valley worse than slavery and I say that a lot of times when people if the person had a slave, he didn't want to kill him because he bought that person and he has a value. The ones that come working here in this valley to the coal, the big coals, they had no value. If he died, they'd take him home, put him on the porch, and we want somebody else to be working there tomorrow. They, they had so many people here that was ready to go into the mines for the work. Where was the human value? There wasn't any. And I mean, a lot of this, this is a unique area. This area, it's really a unique area. The person whose family was here, the hardships that they went through was, was unreal. It really was. It was unreal, the hardships. And they were the same way. And that's why everything that you get in the, these different towns, Jessup and Beckville, that's why they were so closely knit. And there were so many churches in there. The churches that 
There was no government to help the family. If that person died, it, it was the church and the group from that town that kept the other ones going. I mean, this whole valley was real closely knit people. They were. And you, you won't find it anywhere else. I don't think you'd find it anywhere else in the world than here. Especially the amount of, of immigrants that come here in different nationalities. And they all, they survived. I mean, a lot of them died, but they survived, and you're witness of it. Talk about Revolutionary War walking. What was it, 35 days from Yorktown to Boston? I can't remember. Huh? I can't remember. I think it was 35 days. Washington had the Battle of Yorktown. He takes out of Yorktown, stops at his house for a little bit, and then goes on to Boston. Now we're walking. I mean, these people, they walked. Your big towns, you know why your big towns were set up the way they were? 125 miles. What's 125 miles from here? Philadelphia. What's another 125 miles from here? Harrisburg. How far is it from Harrisburg to Philadelphia? They would do a week's run and they had their supply set up so they would go by the day and at the end of the day they were running about 20-25 miles a day and then there'd be a place there where there'd be a tavern or something that they could lay over and in 125 miles that's where your forts were and your forts were stationed that far apart and I mean when they walked they <laughs> they walked I mean that was a it, it was tough the amount that I'm carrying now was be nothing to the amount that these guys would be carrying they had their backpack they had uh, sleeping they had change of socks, they had a change of shirt, they had another pair of pants, uh, flints, I have flints on me, but they'd have flints. If you were in the military, everybody got to carry a little bit something heavy, you might have got a, a pot, or you might have the uh, post for the fireplace, or you might have uh, an axe or a hatchet, or you know, you might have the a kettle that's going to melt the lead. You might be one of the ones that's hauling the lead. Everybody had their own stuff to handle. Plus, they had the unit stuff to handle. So it was it was rough. It really was. It was tough. You mentioned the uh, rifles that had the walls made specific for them. Does that mean that each soldier had to melt their own uh, lead balls? <laughs> Uh, no, usually that was taken care of by the quartermaster. The quartermaster would have control over the, the, the cartridges, the musket. He would tell how many cartridges, musket balls he had. He'd put them together and he'd keep it supplied. These are not rifles. These are muskets. You know the difference between a musket and a rifle? No? A musket is smooth bore. If you look in this and you put your finger in it, there's nothing in this. This is a hollow pipe. So when they put the musket ball down and that musket ball goes out, that musket ball just goes straight out. Now this is one of the reasons the rifles that they had were more accurate. The rifles had actually rifling, which would be a groove in the barrel. And as that groove went down the barrel, it twisted. So now they put the bullet in, and when the bullet comes out, it's twisting when it comes out. If you throw a football and you put a twist on it, it's more accurate than something that's just going to come out and go straight. So when that rifling in the barrel, that rifling made it a lot more accurate. These, these were just muskets. Now a lot of these were carried over to the... Uh, Civil War. There was a lot of muskets left in the Civil War. A lot of the muskets in the Civil War they would take and they switched the uh, hammers out and they put percussion caps in it. Now what a percussion cap is, is they take a cap that has a powder in it and they set it on the end of the hammer then this hammer actually hammers down on it and that flame goes into the barrel. It took longer to load a percussion than it did this. We're in the Civil War. This is a percussion. Now, 
this has got a little tip that's sticking up here that's got to have a cap in it. So I come down here, I open up my wound pouch, I take the cap off, I put the cap on there, so now I've just made one move. Now I come down here and I pull out my cartridge and I open up my cartridge, same as they did in the Rev War, dump the par powder in, put the musket ball in, ram it, but I had another extra, I had to open up and get the cap out and put the cap on it. If I'm in the Rev War, I pull this up, flip it up, tear it off, here's my powder, I power, close it, I don't have to reach twice to get a cap off. The di difference being, if this powder gets wet, this is not going to fire. If you're out in the rain, when you fire this, this will end up being mud. It'll turn to muck. That's why they have these, you, you clean it out, and then you'll take your pick and you'll try poking them. Once, these, once this musket gets wet, it, it's not going to fire. Now what they would do, if it got wet, or if they run out of musket balls, <laughs> Ah! <laughs> they would stab them. Now they they use, use those when they got within a certain distance of each other. You're saying before they. A lot of times they fought in. There was battles they fought, and the the your bayonet was on the gun. This gun will fire with the bayonet on it. These things have been outlawed through the Geneva. You can still, they, they didn't outlaw the bayonet to say just this type of bayonet. If you look at this bayonet, this was really for killing. See the scoop in here? That was to let the blood run out. See the three blades? You had a blade on the back and two blades on the side. So when they stabbed you with this, it made a puncture wound. Well, tell me how you're going to seal a puncture wound. The center never closes up. So a year after they've stabbed you with this, you die from infection. Especially when they made a handle that you could put on this. And say you got this at night, you got a handle on the end of it. What are you going to use it for? Well, let me see. I don't want my meat to be cold tonight. <laughs> Boy, that was good, but I'm not going to wash it. <laughs> I don't take a bath, so why should I wash this? Now I pull it out, and I put it on, and I stab him with it where I cooked my meat onto this last week. <laughs> yeah. And where does all this here bacteria and everything go when I stab them? It ain't right in the beginning. I mean, this here, you're putting right into the person's intestines. That's why a lot of these people died a year later. They said it was inhumane. And that's another thing George Washington said. George Washington put an order out. He didn't want anybody cooking their food with the bayonet. That was another order. He, he did not want anybody cooking their food with their bayonet. Why was that? They weren't, didn't know term theory back then, so why, why did he say that? Well, this, this, this one here you can hold. This is no problem at all because this isn't sharp. But then bayonets, back, you get the real bayonet, this, this, you touch this, you're going to get cut. So now he's got a hundred soldiers going around and they get their little bit of grog at night. They gave them a little bit because they didn't want them getting drunk. But if they got more than that in the grog and they got their bayonets and somebody accidentally cut somebody else, now we got a soldier that's infected that... We just did away with a soldier by his own men. George, they, he was trying to keep disease out of the camp. He really was. He, I mean, he was one that was trying to do away with a lot of the disease that was happening in the camps. When were the uh, bayonets outlawed under Geneva? Nope. When were the bayonets finally outlawed? Well, they had them right up until 1812, so it was after that. Was it? Uh, the triangular bayonet actually 
Because in the Civil War, yeah, they had them yet in the Civil War. Civil War was the same bayonet as this. But that was the thing. Even then, there were so many people that were dying from infection from it because you get stabbed. It's a, it's a three, it's a star. There's no way really to close it up. So, and a lot of people died from infection. A lot of people. What impact did the Civil War have on this area? What impact did the Civil War have on this area? A lot of the men went from this area to fight in the Civil War. It was hardships on the family that was left. Uh, a lot of them were patriots. I know when my uh, grandfather got back, one of the hard things he put up with was he was down in Virginia. He did duty in uh, Yorkstown, and they went up to a farmer, and they needed a horse. And he was actually the, he was a, a quartermaster and he was the veterinarian. And they seized the guy's horse to use the horse. And here he said it was the only horse that the guy had. It was his only means of plowing the field and producing for his family. And here you're taking his horse. And now the guy has no means to plant his crops or anything else. And a lot of the things that happened during the Civil War the people in this area, they, it affected them for the rest of their lives, the memories and stuff. A lot of people died. More people died in the Civil War than, than you get into today. I mean, the, the masses of amounts that were killed in the Civil War was unreal. I read one somewhere where the next stop on the Confederacy coming north was going to be Scranton because they were making the iron steel there. I know, I know they were. Scranton was producing more iron during the Civil War yeah. than Pittsburgh was. Yeah, that's the case that I think. Whether it was actually intended to stick his nose this far north and get it back to the supply lines, that was probably a question. A lot of the supplies weren't. I mean, your coal and stuff like that. Your coal was coming from here for you know, like your locomotive stuff, you know. Uh, they supplied a lot of, of things during the Civil War, but uh, it wasn't what you call really build up the full strength in here yet for the industry. It wasn't until, I'm going to say about the mid, a little, right after the Civil Wars when everything broke loose here the silk mills and everything else, that's when they broke loose here. And a lot of reasons why they broke loose here is the, the coal industry. You take the coal, Philadelphia, New York, you know why the streets are made of cobblestones? Where'd the cobblestone come from? Don't know. We take coal here, we put it on the ship, well, first thing, we take the coal here, we put it on the gravity railroad, it ends up in Honesdale or Hawley, from there it's put on a barge, from barge it travels 120 miles to Kingston, New York, so it's as far away from New York City as it was when it left here, it gets to Kingston, it puts it on big barges, it ships it down to New York City, it puts it on ships, ballast. ballast. They put it on the ship, they send it overseas, they unload the coal. Now we need something for the ship to sit down into the water. Oh, let me see. We, we don't need any more stones because we're killing the miners so fast. Let's load up the ship with people. So they load up the ship with people and the people come back over here. They get the people off, they send the people back up the, the canals. The people come back into the area, the same place the coal left from. Huh, we got more workers. Yep. And the, end, the uh, industrial 
age here come real fast. I mean, it, it come real fast. You get in 1850, that's when the Gravity Railroad started. In 1862, I think it was, when they had the miner strike. When they had the miner strike, the, the coal mines didn't care if they were out on strike. What the coal mines do when the miners struck? Huh? They tore up the Gravity Railroad. Before that, the Gravity Railroad was a wooden plank with an iron uh, strip on the top of it. As soon as they went on strike, boy, we'd have no workers. We don't have to pay them. Tear up all the railroad and put down an iron beam. Tore up every one of the wooden tracks and they put down the iron rail. As soon as they went back to work, now we twice as much in our gravity railroad than we did before they went out on strike. We can have them produce twice as much coal now because we can haul it.